So we begin a new message series in the month of September called Live Your Call. Uh, many things call us in life, right? I get text messages from people we know, you get text messages from people you don't know, okay? Uh, you, uh, we get uh, jury duty. That's a kind of a summons that kind of reshapes our week or hopefully it's just a week or a couple of days, you know? And then there are bosses, right? They call us and they want special things done at the most inopportune times. And then of course, there's our loved ones, right? Our loved ones uh, call upon us, whether it be opportune moments or, mo- or the missed opportune moments, whatever, that they want our attention, right? And that can change our schedules, it can change what we do, our normal routines, and so on. Call- calls like that shape us, and they shape our choices, our values, our attitudes. God has a call, too, for us. And his call is that we worship him, but not just sing songs and pray prayers and engage in sacraments, but also to live a lifestyle of surrender and holiness to him. He also calls us to become like his son Jesus in character and values. He also calls us to have a servant's heart, to serve those in need, but also those that come into our life situations. He also calls us to align our life with other brothers and sisters in Christ, other Christians, that we can walk together as spiritual friends in this journey that he calls us to, a journey to eternal life. And then finally, he calls us to share the hope we found in Christ with other people, the lost in the world, the suffering, the broken of heart. These, this call in this fashion is meant to align our choices, our values, and priorities with his heart for us. We call this call, if you would, conversion, where it's a change of heart and mind that affects our choices and values and behavior so we can come in more closer alignment with what he wants for our life, what he's revealed to us, particularly in his word and scripture. So we begin today talking about live your call, and we begin with our first reading from the book of Deuteronomy. Moses is putting a call out to Israel and he's actually becoming, my call, uh, supernaturally inspired, redundant, okay, in this call. He says, hear the statues and decrees, which I'm teaching. Then he goes on to say, observe that you may live. And again, he goes on to say, observe the commandments. And then he says, don't add to them and don't take away from them. He says, but observe caref- them carefully. He, so you can get the point he's making. It's like he's saying, this call is really, really important. Your life depends on it, Israel. What he's talking about here is the Torah, which was the foundation life of living as a Jewish person. It's what God has revealed about himself and how God also revealed how he wanted them to live. And if you did that, he says, if you live that way in accordance to the Torah, he says, this is what will happen. You will be a wise and intelligent people among the nations. Matter of fact, he says, the nations will think you so wise and you'll be so blessed that they're gonna look at you and they're gonna say, this great nation is truly wise and intelligent. And I'm just adding a little caveat to it. They're probably talking amongst themselves. They're so blessed, we'd like to have what they got. And that was the whole purpose of it. It was to provoke the nations to say, we want what you have because we see how blessed you are. And so Moses said, if you live according to the Torah, to the what's been revealed to you, you will become the most wise and intelligent people in the face of the earth, and it will provoke others to say, we want that too for our life. James accents the same kind of thinking here as he opens his letter. He's writing to a church in Jerusalem, a rather poor church, but he's writing to pastor them as he's a bishop of of his church, and he says, humbly welcome the word that's been planted in you. It's power to save you, to save your souls. Now, the, the phrase humbly welcome is the word we get for hospitality. So think of it this way. You invited some friends over for, for dinner and you prepared the house, you cleaned the house, you got it all beautifully looking. You had the, you had the meal prepared, meticulously prepared. The table was set beautifully. They knock at the door. You would not, not think of opening the door for them, right? You would say, oh, you open the door and say, come on in, right? That's what James is saying here. Humbly welcome and say, he says, it's like saying to the word of God, come on in, 
Dwell in my heart, dwell in my soul, shape my life, change my values, change my priorities to align with what the word says. That's the impact of what he's saying here. Welcoming the word. As one of the early church fathers said, welcome the word as a guest of, the, of your soul. It has the power to save you, transform you, change you. And then Jesus is also in that same vein, speaking to the Pharisees today. Now, Pharisees were a renewal movement in Israel about 200 years preceding, 200 years before Jesus came onto the scene. Their whole theme was to keep Israel distinct from the nations around them, um, particularly the pagan Roman Empire, okay, which held them in captivity because they were, they were subject to the Roman Empire. And the Romans had a pantheon of gods that they worshipped and their lifestyles were totally contrary to the Torah, basically, right? And so the Pharisees had this one big thing, is that we got to live differently to preserve our identity as Jewish people. So Mark details some of the things. They were concerned about all the outward things. For example, when you wash, when, before you eat, wash your hands. Now it sounds like good, solid, common sense advice, right? They weren't interested in the common sense part of it, okay? Nor the hygiene part of it. They were interested, it's a ritual thing you did to make yourself distinct from the Romans. And then when you buy cups and jugs and kettles and beds, he says, purify all that. Again, they weren't interested in hygiene. They were interested in being distinct from the pagans who don't do those things. And then they, then they turn to Jesus and say, how come you're not teaching this stuff to your followers? <laughs> and then Jesus chooses the occasion to reveal something much deeper of what he's about. Now, you have to remember these were traditions that had grown up around already 634 commandments found in the Torah. You're talking about almost another 2,600 interpretations of those 634 commandments. No one got it except them, <laughs> okay? And no one followed them except them. And so they say to Jesus, how come you're not doing this too? And he says to them at this point, he says, you people, you honor me with your lips, but your hearts are far from me. In other words, you engage in all the ritual participation, but your heart is not aligned with my heart for the people. So then he says this rather, he's actually, the, Mark puts it really strongly. He says he summoned the crowd. Now summon is a very strong, it's like a, like a court summoning you to court kind of thing. That's what Jesus when he was summoning the crowd in a very solemn way. And he was speaking very prophetically to the nation of Israel at this point. He says, hear me, all of you, and understand. It's kind of like, like you got to really listen to this because your life will depend on it. Your life now, your life forever. And he makes this statement, a solemn statement. He says, it's not what goes into you that defiles you. It's the stuff that comes out of you that defiles you. And he went on to catalog, which I won't go through at all, but unchastity, theft, greed, adultery, malice, deceit, all those envy, and so on. He says, that stuff is what defiles your heart, corrupts charity in your heart, and alienates you from a relationship with God. It was a really solemn, solemn statement by Jesus out of his care and love for where the emphasis should be, not on the outward observances, but on the inward transformation of the heart. We call that conversion. Why is conversion necessary? You say, well, I'm a Catholic. I've converted. And that's great for choice, for beginnings. But whether our conversion is initial or whether it's ongoing and deepening, the whole point is that our hearts and our values, priorities, our attitudes become changed and transformed and aligned with God's heart revealed in his word. Adam and Eve were created to live in a perfect relationship with God, and they didn't do that. They used their free will and their, their choice to say, God, thank you for creating us, but we'll take it from here and run our life as we want to. And that allowed all this 
separation from God to occur in their hearts and their lives, and that separate them from God, but also open their heart up to all kinds of kind of the corruption that Jesus talked about here. There are things that drove their life that also drive every single human person. Things like, for example, guilt. Guilt drives some people's life. Regrets and shame accompany it for the choices they made. And they, their memories are locked in to the past and they can't move forward. Other people are driven by resentments and anger in their heart. Things that they've been mistreated on, been offended in, and they carry those things deep within. And sometimes the anger is kept inside. For other people, it's a rage, it's an explosion. Some people are driven by fears and anxieties because of traumatic experiences that have happened to them in the past. And it's like a self-imposed prison they're in, and they just can't get free. And so there's a lot of loss of untapped potential in their life. And then some people are driven by, by materialism. The more things they have, the more power they have, the more status they have, the more, better they feel about themselves. But our self-worth is not defined by what we have or don't have. It's defined by a relationship with God. And lastly, some people are driven by the approval of others, right? They need to have others approving them. They either follow the crowd or get lost in the crowd. But Jesus said, no one can serve two masters. Now, these things are all the result of what we call consequences of that original sin that have affected our life. Paul said it this way, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And there are things that drive our life that manipulate it and keep us from the best that we're called to be by the Lord. Paul went on to say, the wages of sin is death. So these things that drive us can be things that can really deteriorate our heart's well-being and the closest of relationships to us, and particularly become walls and barriers in our relationship to God. But he went on to say, it's the wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. It's the life, it's the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the gift of the Holy Spirit that he pours out upon us that is intended to free us of those things that drive our life. We're called to live a different way of life, just like the Israelites were called, and it's by the death and resurrection of Jesus and the gift of the Holy Spirit that enables us to live differently than those around us who are driven by these kinds of things. Paul said it this way, if anyone be in Christ, the old has passed away, all things become new. We're called to live a different way of life because of the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the gift of his Holy Spirit living in us. We don't have to be driven by the things that drive other people. Matter of fact, as Christians, we should be able to say, I was this way. But my encounter and growth and conversion to Christ has freed me, so I'm now this way. And what happened to me can happen to you too. So how do we experience conversion? How do we change? Again, conversion isn't just for those that want to become Catholic. It's for us. It's for us to align our values and choices and priorities with that of Jesus for us so we can have the happiness in this life that he purposed for us and the happiness that he envisions for us in all eternity. So let's talk about some ways we can do that. First, it begins with the person of Jesus Christ. It begins with discovering Christ in our life. We say, oh, I'm a Catholic. I've been, I know Christ. I've been a Catholic all my life. When we talk about conversion, it may be a beginning for some. For a lot of us, it may be a deepening of conversion, ongoing conversion. So that means discovering Christ over again so we may discover his love for us, his power, his sacrifice for us at the cross, and what he wants to do to change our life now. It means also making quality choices to say, I want you as my Savior and my Lord. I want to follow you. I want my life and priorities to be lined up with your priorities for my life. It begins with that choice before him. It also continues with feeding our minds on the truth as found in God's word in scripture. St. Augustine said that where scripture speaks, God speaks. 
scriptures or God speaking to us, whether we hear him at church, like we did a few minutes ago, whether we hear him personally by reading them ourselves, where we hear him by attending a seminar that teaches the scriptures. The point is that where scripture speaks, God's talking to us. He's revealing himself to us, how he wants us to live, how he wants us to be a wise people, how he wants us to be free of the things that keep us from the wisdom that will truly bring a blessing into our life that overflows to others. Jesus said it this way in Matthew chapter 4, one does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from out of the mouth of God. So in other words, our social media will not be the bread that will feed us and nourish us. Okay. The political scenario doesn't, isn't going to be the scenario that feeds and nourishes us. Right? Uh, the favorite sitcoms and miniseries will not be what will feed and nourish us but it'll be the word of God that come, that nourishes us with the truest meaning for our life and how to live our life in a way to get free of the dry, things that drive us so we can live a life of peace and a life of joy and charity. Thirdly, get rid of the old self, the attitudes, the behaviors, the life choices that are contrary to God's word. That means that we take a look in our hearts and say, what's in my heart? What's coming out of me, right? What's driving my life that becomes blockages and hindrances to our relationship with God and that deteriorates even the closest of relationships to me? I like to say it this way, using this analogy. Everybody in their kitchen has a trash can, right? And we always fill the trash can. <laughs> what if you didn't empty the trash can? Eventually, there would be some ungodly odors floating not only in the kitchen, but throughout the entire house. And if you never empty a trash can, it will become unhealthy for you to live there. Well, we need to take out the trash of our hearts every so often. We call that repentance. We look at the things that are driving us and we say that these things are the trash in my life I need to get rid of because they will clutter and create ungodly relationships in my life that really deteriorate my life and prevent me from truly living in the peace the Lord has for me. And lastly, we need to surrender to a power greater than ourselves so that our life can change. This is not, conversion is not a self, self-help course that you take. Conversion is relying on a power greater than ourselves so we can change. Someone told me a long time ago, they said, the will is mine to change, but the power is God's. That's the Holy Spirit living in us. He's been given to us in baptism and confirmation, but for a lot of us, the Holy Spirit is untapped potential in our life. So over the next several weeks, we'll be exploring that potential, how it can be released in our life in greater ways. Paul said it this way, though, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ, and I'll just paraphrase a little bit, who gives me strength through the power of his Holy Spirit. Finally, St. John Paul II said the parish of the 21st century is to be a center of evangelization, a training ground of holiness, and a school prayer. That's what the parish is to be about. That's the basic MO of the parish, if you would. That's what a center of evangelization, training ground of holiness, and a school of prayer. That's what we're about. And why is that? Because the parish is the place that fosters and cultivates conversion to Jesus Christ, an ongoing conversion, so we can grow in holiness and find our fulfillment of our desires in him. That's why we exist as a parish. So live your call. So let's pray. So, Lord, we ask you to renew your people in zeal to speak and live the gospel. The church may truly be a living sacrament of salvation for all people. We pray, Lord, this day, may we hear your call. May we hear your summons to live the kind of life you want us to live, centered upon your son, formed and shaped by his words so we can reflect his values and character to others. 
so we can cultivate a heart of charity and service to those in need and share the hope of Christ with those who are lost and searching and suffering. Help us to be a people, Lord, who rely upon the power of your Holy Spirit to become what you want us to be so we can live in the happiness you purpose for us here and for all eternity. And we pray this through Christ our Lord. Amen.